My name is Roger Platt. I work at an organization uh, headquartered in the United States called the U.S. Green Building Council. And it will not surprise you that our focus is on advancing, encouraging green building around the world. 130 countries use the LEED rating system, which we developed. I'm also here on behalf of the World Green Building Council, which has 100 members, including the South Africa Green Building Council, um, headquartered in Cape Town. Uh, and the green building movement is one that fits very neatly with the accomplishments and the commitments of the C40 cities. For those of you who, uh, and you had to read the whole report to do this, you who took the advice of Mayor Pice and actually read the whole report, you would see that of the 8,000 individual actions that were identified in that report, over 1,600 you would find only by reading the whole report, 1,600 were buildings related. So that's more than 20% and that is why those of you who are here are in a very practical, very impactful session. I'm going to start um, by introducing Claudio Baffioni from the city of Rome. And he is um, someone who has worked in the past with uh, the Clinton Climate Initiative on some very challenging building retrofit issues. He is someone who believes very strongly that the audience uh, and the other C40 cities need to know ahead of time not only what works, and there's a lot of focus on that here, but also what does not work. Claudio Baffioni. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, these are the topic I'd like to discuss really briefly with you. First of all, Rome at glance. And then I'd like to start with speaking about elements uh, on technical strategics topics, and then administrative strategic elements, and uh, about the peculiarity of Rome. Well, Rome at glance. This is Italy, in yellow. There is the province of the Lazio, the Lazio region, and uh, Lazio is one of uh, 20 regions in Italy. In the yellow, there is the Lazio, and in red is uh, Rome, and the final one, the big one, is uh, the... No. There is something there? Okay. There is uh, the city of Rome. And uh, the municipal area of Rome is uh, about 1,285 square kilometers, with a population about 2,800,000 of inhabitants. And the road networks inside the ring highway around Rome city is the, the, the ring you can see in the pictures are more or less 5,000 kilometers. And in Rome, we have uh, two million and a half of vehicles with the daily, daily trips about more than six million. So I'm speaking about the traffic because if you ever visited Rome, um, the, the traffic in Rome remains in your mind more than Colosseum. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's important to give some information about uh, this data. That uh, we have uh, an incredible historical and cultural heritage and so we have a narrow and not modifiable network of roads. Uh, Rome is the Italian capital city and not Milan. Usually when I go in, uh, in other countries, say Milan is the capital. No, unfortunately, the capital is Rome. But not only uh, is the capital of uh, Italy, but nevertheless, inside Rome, there is another state that is uh, the Vatican City. So we have the double number of embassies, the double number of offices, consulate, and so on, so on, so on. We have, and we are really lucky for this reason, more 20, 27 million per year of tourists, and it means that we have a tourist coach about 200,000 per year in the city. Technical strategic elements. When I speak with the mark, the mark proposes usually two different strategies. The first is to say you can change all the equipments, we are speaking of buildings of course, boilers, windows, frames and so, and you can forget how to manage the management of the building. No, this is going really speaking. 
The other strategy is to define the best building management manual and don't change anything. Well, frankly speaking, I think that it's necessary to define the mean point of equilibrium, discussing, first of all, with public technicians and real estate departments, energy department, environmental department, and last but not least, the budget department. With the, the private companies that work in the sector of energy saving in buildings and exchanging with other cities, the experience, ideas, trouble, and all things that they faced when decided to work in the building energy saving. A strategic and administrative elements. To implement a strategy for building energy efficiency, we must consider the national and the local legislation plus the national and local restrictions. Don't forget that restrictions really play a central law when the, we decide to implement a strategy for building energy efficiency. I want to give you an example of national restriction. Cultural heritage protection, archaeological interest, hydraulic risk area, and uh, aeronautics restrictions, for example, for the airport. For the region, this is at national level, but we have at regional restriction too. Restriction for environment and landscape heritage protection, rights of common, the CVQs, for example. And then we have to face the local restriction, restriction for archaeological protection and restriction for monumental protection. So, in Rome, we would like to solve the problem of energy efficiency in the historical buildup, but we must discuss, first of all, the possible solution, at least with local and national classical antiquities departments and with local and national cultural heritage departments. So there are four different and no technical subjects to discuss. And we need a new suggestion for specialistic centers of research in this topic because uh, this is one of the few fields where it is necessary to have new suggestion from a scientific technical point of view. And the last but not the least, don't forget if uh, a solution works in Madrid or in Venice, it not necessarily will work in Rome for the departments of historical heritage, archaeological heritage, and so. So to say we solve the problem in Venice, not necessarily means that the problem is solved in Rome. And this is an example that probably doesn't work in Rome, for example. So we must to found a different solution. Thank you very much. I saved three minutes of my presentation. <laughs> and thank you to clap for my last slide. Thank you very much. Good, Claudio, you get a special certification for the speed of your presentation. Um, in my efforts to move quickly, I forgot to mention something very, very important and that uh, I will mention again at the end of, of this discussion, which is that the uh, C40 organization has engaged a network of cities, and many of you are perhaps already in or involved in various of these networks, but there is now a network for buildings energy efficiency. So both uh, the kinds of materials and I think the materials that are being provided here will be available to you, but also um, there will be all kinds of other uh, forums for peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And I want to just introduce Shannon Lawrence. Shannon, will you just get up so that people know Shannon is your person for connecting into these networks and making sure that this is a, uh, not just an uh, hour and ten minute educational experience, but a lifelong project. Um, our next speaker is um, very much in almost the um, succession, I want to say, from, uh, from uh, our last speaker's reference to uh, Vatican City. We have uh, here at C40, uh, we had um, the, the current uh, executive of C40 had 
of Matthew Penjars's role. I met another gentleman who was the intermediary in this, but there are uh, many people who have uh, had this very crucial role of senior advisor to the environment, uh, for environment and energy for the Greater London Authority. And the work of London and the work of this office is very inextricably linked to what C40 is all about and its uh, nativity story uh, in the last few years. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Matthew Penjars. He, he's first joined the mayor's team uh, from BBC in November 2009. He is uh, extremely uh, engaged and knowledgeable about these issues, also um, is someone that is uh, sophisticated on the po political context for this and trying to communicate uh, to the greater community um, that the mayor of, of, of London uh, represents about these crucial issues. So Matthew, please, please illuminate us. Um, thank you very much, Roger. I will try and beat seven minutes, although I'm not sure I'll quite pull that off. Um, so just starting with a, a summary, um, I'm going to run through the London context and the mayor's strategic approach to the environment and how building uh, energy efficiency and retrofitting fits into that. And then I'm going to run through our three retrofitting programs, um, and that is for the public sector, for domestic homes, and for the commercial sector. And finally, a success criteria, and how London has overcome some of the challenges that has, have arisen when delivering these programs. And there are a number of common factors, and I'll address these uh, at the end of this presentation. Oh, I think I might be overshooting myself. Sorry. Um, so, um, we want to make London uh, the world's greenest megacity, um, and uh, we have a variety of strategies to try and deliver that. So, we have the climate change uh, mitigation energy strategy. We have to address London's air quality, uh, which is quite a challenge being the biggest city in Europe by some distance. Um, address uh, our, our waste arisings and also how to deal with that in a more efficient and cost-effective way. Um, urban greening and then climate change adaptation, which um, can be taken together to try and manage uh, surface water flooding and fluvial flooding. Uh, London is quite lucky that we are very well protected from river flooding, from the Thames and tidal flooding, uh, because the Thames barrier that we think will still uh, do its job up to the end of this century. And central to all these themes are cost savings for homes and businesses, increasing growth and jobs, um, the co-benefit clearly about uh, mitigating our carbon dioxide emissions, but there's also the astonishing demographic pressure that London is under. Uh, since the current mayor was elected just six years ago, there are 600,000 more Londoners, uh, another million by 2021, and up to 10 million by 2030. Now, for a Western developed city, that's very fast indeed, the fastest growing city, um, certainly in Europe. So we have quite a challenge that. So that's the, um, the other framework we have to work in. And the retrofitting falls under our climate change mitigation and energy stream. So we have a target um, to reduce London's carbon emissions by 60% from 1990 levels. Um, we have reduced them uh, up till now by 20% from 1990 levels. And actually since the mayor was elected in 2008 uh, by 14%. And um, we're focused on three areas on the, uh, in the strategy. One is reducing energy prices for London through buildings retrofit and ensuring a secure, affordable and low carbon supply of energy. Uh, the UK has a very alarming um, energy capacity headroom in just two years' time and we're going to have to do what we can to mitigate that as much as possible. It's uh, around 4% in two years, so we're going to have to do our best to ensure that there's reduced the chance of brownouts in, in the capital and then clearly reducing CO2 emissions as well. Uh, we, we hope we've set a target to uh, supply 25% of London's uh, buildings' energy demand from, um, from domestic, from sources within the city, from local sources. So then by using um, the waste heat effectively, it becomes a low carbon source of heat and power. Okay. Um, nearly 80% of London's CO2 emissions are from our buildings, and it's expected that 80% of these will still be standing in 2050. And you will see that we have a huge um, number of Victorian terraces, especially in older buildings, that are quite challenging to retrofit. So although in the UK we actually have some of the lowest energy prices per unit in Western Europe, 
um, we have some of the highest energy bills, and that's because our building stock is so energy inefficient, actually the sixth least energy efficient in the UK. Um, the UK was, has been quite lucky historically that we had cheap coal followed by cheap oil and gas from the North Sea until quite recently, and only, recent, only very recently has been a, a real economic driver to um, increase our country's um, uh, energy efficiency. So I said earlier we have the three programmes, the public sector, domestic homes, and the commercial sector, and I'll run through those now. So starting with Refit, which is our public sector buildings programme, and the drivers for these were, um, in, are enabled by the national legislation requiring public bodies to report their energy use and pay a fixed cost per tonne of carbon dioxide they emit. And there's clearly also the increasing energy costs that we're having and uh, a focus on reducing public sector costs um, has proven to be a strong drive for action. And the main point of refit, to up sum it in a sentence, is to make it easy for public authorities. And we actually did de um, first develop this programme with C40 uh, a few years ago. So it's an energy performance contracting approach where energy savings are contractually guaranteed by the supplier, which is the energy services company, or ESCO, and the guarantee effectively provides a, return, a fixed return on investment for public bodies and removes a significant amount of the risk for them. And we've also procured a panel of, of these ESCOs to carry out the energy efficiency work and supply retrofits in public sector buildings. And the important part of this is it redu reduces procurement costs and timescales for public bodies. Those, um, um, uh, my fellow European cities will know how cumbersome what we call OG procurement rules are, and I'm sure uh, lots of other cities share similarly cumbersome procurement rules, which add to the cost. So the point of the refit scheme is specifically to take away that particular issue and uh, make it easier to do. And the sorts of public bodies that can use refit are schools and universities, municipal buildings of all types, so town halls, office buildings, police and fire stations, uh, bus and uh, transit stations and libraries, hospitals and possibly museums and other charity bodies which are also required to um, go under the EU procurement rules. And so far we've done 245 buildings being retrofitted, um, about £30 million of investment and an average payback of 8.3 years. So th this is deep retrofit programme that we're doing so with, the, um, with the, uh, the deeper measures being sort of cross-subsidised by the easier, cheaper measures that deliver the savings very quickly. And the future pipeline is 110 public bodies, 900 plus buildings, uh, around 90 million um, capex, and 6,000 tonnes of uh, CO2 mitigated. And the programme has been such a success that the UK government is going to roll, roll out this framework around the rest of the country. Um, the way it's financed is through the, through the Mayor's energy and carbon targets, um, which can be achieved through public financing alone. So quite a few public sector bodies have reserves and they spend to invest. But equally, there are obviously some which have uh, more complicated uh, finance structures and we have other sources of funding such as the London Energy Efficiency Fund and also Segelix, which is a government loan scheme that provides 0% loans. And looking forward, the Green Investment Bank and the European Investment Bank were looking for um, funding to go for further forward. And then there's Renew, which is the domestic homes programme. And the drivers for this have been increased energy costs for households and the increasing numbers of people entering fuel poverty because of those increased costs. And there's a national government policy framework on obligation energy suppliers to reduce energy use of customers by um, retrofitting. So the phase one of Re Renew was an area-based uh, approach offering free, easy to install energy efficiency measures to all homes and installing further energy efficiency measures such as a loft and cavity wall installation where possible and around 100,000 domestic properties took, um, took part in phase one. Phase two are following a change in the government um, a framework and the energy company obligation. Uh, we have been focusing very much on um, where you can aggregate large uh, scale uh, domestic retrofitting, that's using social housing and the private rented sector, where you will have one landlord owning possibly thousands of units. And we're developing a support team to, again, make it easy for these bodies to do the retrofitting and to aggregate, um, aggregate the capex into decent chunks for the energy companies then to invest uh, their eco. And we have a panel of organisations that can deliver energy efficiency works to cons again, to considerably reduce the procurement costs that, and timescales for the social housing providers and local authorities that, again, can be a barrier for, and delay for retrofitting. Um, and the, uh, the 
project delivery work has been initially funded directly through the Greater London Authority, but, uh, but more recently we are again bidding to the European Union to help deliver that. And finally, the corporate sector, or the commercial sector, um, these are responsible for three quarters of London's workplace emissions. And again, there is some national legislation in place which helps, such as uh, the CRC Energy Efficiency Scheme, and the uh, same as the public bodies, and also uh, they look at cost reductions, uh, which are particularly important in sectors with, with tight more margins. And we're developing this programme again with Shannon and uh, with C40. So the Mayor is developing this programme, which will include an online tool to measure and report emissions, and an awards programme focused on large businesses. We, believe, we don't have a strong policy lever to instruct buildings to be uh, retrofitted, but we feel a competition among some of the big corporates will really drive that. And we already have quite a large number which have done quite a bit, but getting those and others on board, we feel, will um, drive forward this program. So we have a target of 50 corporates in the, uh, this 14-15 finan financial year, going up to 200 and 500 um, by 16-17. And we've set agreed targets with um, um, for this program, hoping to have a, a reduction from 1990 levels at 2025 between 45 to 65% in their uh, energy usage, which fits with the um, target we have of the 60% reduction uh, by 2025. Of course, commercial sector will tend to fund improvements through their own financing with the internal business cases to show payback of a few years. And um, clearly, uh, the public sector, we won't be allowed to fund that directly, but we can certainly facilitate it and make it easy for them to do so. And finally, and I've got 41 seconds left, so before uh, Roger coughs me off, um, the successor criteria. Um, in delivering refit and renew, we've overcome a significant number of challenges, and we've identified the following criteria, adaptability, so we've been able to adapt to changing government policy and the financial economic factors. And it's essential to longevity of programmes. And we have seen some constant changing, specifically of central government um, policy, which has made it more difficult. Streamlined procurement. I think this is incredibly important when you, um, when you think about the numbers of buildings, the numbers of bodies you want to do. You want to make it as easy as you possibly can. So we feel we've got over some of the OGU cumbersome rules by having these frameworks, uh, which makes it easy again for these bodies to do that. Business case development, we need strategic buy-in from the decision makers. And it's my view that it's the FD and the CEO who needs to grab the attention of to drive this forward. Uh, because it's the bottom line is what drives these people. And that is how we're going to get the retrofit programs we want delivered. And finally, data and measurement. And I, I'm sure I should quote um, Mayor Bloomberg, that if you can't measure it, you can't change it. I may be paraphrasing him. But that's the important thing, is to have decent data and benchmarking that you can, that you can measure again. So finally, I now have mine, I now have mine, and Roger's about to jump up and kick me off the stage. Um, we are relatively far along on our retrofit journey. There are, we understand the challenges, and there are still some more to overcome, but we believe we're successfully overcoming them, and I actually think our programs is a great credit to C40 because they helped us directly in developing some of them. So thank you. Thank you, Matthew, and <clears throat> thank you especially for referencing the, the role that C40 has played both in the evolution of some of these programs and then also how you're getting these programs out through the C40 network. This is what it's all about. Um, our next speaker is Monica Barone. She's the Chief Executive Officer for the City of Sydney in Australia. And in that capacity, she, among other things, had to oversee the development of the city's long-term sustainable city, Sydney 2030 strategy. So she is looking at this issue in the context of multiple um, aspects of her job, and that gives her a great perspective on it. Monica. Thank you. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the C40 and the leadership, courage, and persistence demonstrated by the chairs, the committees, and the staff. The City of Sydney joined C40 over six years ago. Whenever I'm asked about the benefits of membership, I stress the camaraderie and support I experience by being part of a global community of cities who, without exception, are working to make cities um, where the majority of the world's people live resilient, prosperous, and safe. If you're in the business of running cities, and we all are, 
You know firsthand the impacts on people's lives, health and the economy of power failures, water shortages or inadequate sanitation. It is wonderful to belong to a network where political, social and cultural differences are not used as an excuse to avoid doing the right thing for the millions of people who live in our cities and depend on us. So now to today's topic. In my talk today, I'm only going to be focusing on the things that we're doing in the broader city, not the city administration. The city is um, undertaking uh, all of its own programs and we have become we the first Australian city to achieve carbon neutral status under the federal government's accreditation scheme. So, after the City of Sydney attended our first C40, we returned to our city inspired, and we spent the next 18 months consulting with our community to develop this vision document, Sustainable Sydney 2030. We summarised everything that people said to us that they wanted us to do into three key words. They told us they wanted a city that was green, global and connected. Over 90% of people who uh, participated in surveys stressed that they wanted us to do something about climate change, and that's why green is first. This is the document that sets all our targets, policy directions, programs, and budget. Sustainable Sydney aims to reduce emissions by 70% by 2030, based on our 2006 baseline. We then set about conducting research into the best things we could do within existing resources to achieve this target. What we found, unsurprisingly, was given the makeup of the part of the city that we're responsible for, the inner city, commercial buildings accounted for 71% of our emissions, residential accounted for 9%, with transport and waste to landfill accounting for the remainder. We also worked out that 65% of buildings in our commercial district were probably still going to be there in 2030, and that over 50% of the commercial office buildings were owned by 14 institutional owners. Armed with this research, we decided that although we had to work on many fronts, we needed to concentrate our efforts and resources on actions that would make the biggest difference. Even though we know we cannot achieve our targets by just relying on bringing on new energy efficient buildings, we still demand high standards from new buildings. Industry led initiatives such as the Green Building Council Green Star Ratings are important drivers of high quality efficient new build. Since Green Star was released in 2003, over 90% of the developments and retrofits that could have used Green Star to certify their best practice, environmental design and construction, have achieved ratings of between four and six stars. However, we know that we need to focus on making existing buildings more energy and water efficient. To this end, we have developed several programs for our commercial and residential sectors. We've also developed a major financing tool to support owners who want to undertake substantial building retrofit programs. The first is City Switch Green Office. City Switch is the program that supports commercial building tenants to achieve a minimum 4.5 star Neighbours rating. Neighbours is the Office Energy Efficient Assessment Tool, which has now been adopted by the Federal Government as the tool for the mandatory reporting under Commercial Building Disclosure Program brought in by the Federal Government in 2011. That means that when you sell your building, you have to advertise, you have to let people know the rating of the building. To date, in our city, 116 tenant businesses who represent about 17.5% of the commercial floor space in the city have joined City Switch and are achieving an average 5.1 stars. We have also rolled out City Switch as a national program and nationally, um, there are 516 tenancies that represent 12% of all commercial office space in Australia. In 2011, um, inspired by the City of London, we also established the Better Buildings Partnership, made up of the 14 institutional owners of over 50% of the commercial office buildings in our city. 
Since the inception of this program, the Better Building Partners members have reduced absolute emissions from their, sh their shared portfolio by 31%, saving $25 million a year in energy costs. While office buildings and their tenants are significant consumers of energy in our city, there are still a lot of other businesses that contribute to our emissions footprint. Our Smart Green Business Program has been assisting the largest of these businesses to improve their energy efficiency as well as their waste and water impacts. And this year we're working with the 100 of, of Sydney's largest hotels. Inspired by the city of Melbourne, we have developed a financing mechanism um, to support commercial owners to improve building efficiency. Environmental upgrade agreements enable commercial owners to finance uh, to access finance for building retrofit that is then paid back via an environmental upgrade charge applied by the city. This way, the owner and the tenant can share the costs as long as any cost passed on to tenants does not exceed the savings that the tenant achieves as a result of the building being more efficient. This is a picture of our Lord Mayor Clover Moore signing the $26 million environmental upgrade agreement with Fraser's property. More than two-thirds of our residents live in high-density apartment buildings, and in 2011, the city initiated the green, uh, Smart Green Apartments program. We are currently working with 30 residential buildings as a trial and worked out that they can reduce 30% of energy and 26% of water consumption, mainly through efficiency measures. So as you can see, we have a range of sustainability programs that focus on different sectors in our community. But we also need to look to the future and understand what we need to do next to tr truly drive building energy efficiency further. We are currently undertaking a significant study to determine the remaining cost-effective energy efficient actions for each sector. The preliminary findings from the draft energy efficiency master plan model indicates that we could achieve as much as a further 35% energy um, use reductions by 2030. And we look forward to working with the C40 to review that plan. The energy efficiency master plan will complement our other master plans. The more we learned about what we needed to do to achieve our ambitious Sustainable Sydney 2030 agenda, the more we understood that we could not simply rely on retrofitting our buildings. We needed to retrofit our city. We've now completed our decentralised renewable energy master plan, our decentralised trigeneration energy master plan, and our decentralised water master plan. Although we're a long way from implementing these master plans in their entirety, this work has significantly influenced the way people across Australia are now thinking about the future of energy and water infrastructure. Finally, I'd like to conclude by telling you about an artwork we recently commissioned as part of our annual Art and About Festival. Deutsche Bank was the setting of Building Run, a data-driven artwork that put the spotlight on energy consumption and building efficiency. Building Run was the creation of artist Keith Deverell. The video installation project presented five athletes. Behind each human facade was an energy efficient building that controlled each human avatar's performance using actual building energy consumption data. The athletes would speed up or slow down with the cycle of energy usage measured each day across the five prominent high performance buildings in Sydney. So at the beginning of the day, when energy in the use in the building was low, the runners ambled along. However, as more energy was needed to power the building, they had to fa run faster and started to show the strain of exertion. Projects like this help us to both increase the public's awareness of building energy efficiency, as well as providing building owners an opportunity to demonstrate and promote what they are achieving. Thank you. Well, that was really, really impressive. It's as though uh, it's possible to live in an alternative universe in which 90% of all the buildings that can be certified to, in this case, the uh, excellent Green Star rating system are actually doing it, which is 
in itself an amazing fact. Another thing I just want to mention is that Monica's enthusiasm and, and competence in, in making these things work is only somewhat um, ad uh, adjusted by her own personal love. She was an art consultant in a former life. She, was in, she did some work in theater in a former life. And so when she shows you this um, final um, initiative to demonstrate performance with reference to these um, actors and athletes, you're, you're integrating all kinds of parts of your, of your expertise. Anyway, that's, it's really, really impressive. Um, the, next, um, the next presenter is from the city of Philadelphia, and you would have to be brain dead not to notice the mayor of Philadelphia, who's been a very prominent um, participant in um, the uh, plenary sessions. Um, we have the pleasure of hearing from Catherine uh, Gajewski, who is um, his primary uh, advisor on the environment and who um, will be able to take us through um, what Philadelphia is doing in a little more uh, detail and more specificity than the mayor already has done, but with an emphasis on, on energy efficiency. Um, I just want to uh, highlight that um, Catherine um, has already helped the city make huge strides in green since being given the position since 2009, but she is not resting on laurels and will talk to us both about what's been accomplished and what still needs to be accomplished. Catherine. Thank you, Roger. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly. I'll try to keep it short so that I can contribute towards the Q&A time. But wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing in city government and how that's led us to develop some of our citywide building efficiency programs. And by way of very quick background, I will start by saying um, when Mayor Nutter came into office and when we developed our Greenworks Philadelphia plan in 2009, it was the first time the city of Philadelphia had a sustainability plan in place. It was the first time we really set targets. And we set targets um, admittedly with a lot, without a lot of the data that we needed to set our baselines. So we set goals and then we went out and tried to figure out how to get the data so that we could understand where we were and where we would need to go in order to achieve our goals. So we set a goal for ourselves to reduce city government building energy use by 30% by the year 2015. So we set our goals within the time span of the mayor's time in office because we really wanted to show, A, some quick wins, and also really tie it to um, his commitments as mayor. And then we set a goal to reduce citywide building energy use by 10% by 2015. So both pretty ambitious goals for us. And again, um, we didn't have all the data that we needed to really understand the full story of what was happening in Philadelphia. So by having the sustainability plan in place, we then went out and and started to gather the data, and every year it gets better and better, and we report it publicly. But what we learned is, like all of the other cities that have been up here so far, is that our buildings contribute the majority of our greenhouse gas emissions in the city. So not a surprise, but something we didn't have very solid data around, so we were able to confirm that. Um, and then in city government, we also were able to start measuring our own energy use. We had a really antiquated system in place that basically allowed us to pay our utility bills, but didn't help us to analyze our data. So we did these very kind of boring but necessary first steps around transitioning systems so that we could start measuring energy use, which led us to more strategic procurement, which led us to then greenhouse gas analysis, which has led us to benchmarking, and I'll kind of talk about this trajectory. But I think that's probably a shared story that one step helps you lead to the next. Um, and the information you get in one phase of work helps to determine what you do next. So we've been very, I think, deliberate in that way, trying not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but make sure that we're really making decisions based on best information at the time, and really trying to make sure that we're moving in a way that helps us to um, achieve real results. So on the building front, we decided that we really... Um, in Philadelphia, I was going to say we're an old city, but Rome is here, so I know I can't say that in the context of Rome, but um, in the U.S., we're, you know, an old city, one of the oldest cities, and our infrastructure is very old, and the city has really underinvested in our municipal buildings for many, many decades now. And as we all know, cities are usually the largest building owner in any municipality. 
we certainly are in Philadelphia. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of buildings from City Hall and an art museum to fire stations and rec centers. And a lot of these are in terrible condition. And the public knows that. They drive through their neighborhood and they see the rec center. Their kids go to the rec center and they're in there and they see bad lighting, bad furniture, whatever. So we knew that if we were gonna do anything on the citywide energy front, we had to lead by example and start dealing with our own building stock, which was a challenge because we don't have a huge capital budget. Um, when we came into office, the recession hit soon after. So we've been working within the context of um, constrained resources. But we knew we needed to make inroads there. So um, we've been doing our municipal work and we realized that we really needed to learn more about our buildings and we needed to prioritize. We wouldn't be able to get around to all 600 of our buildings, so we needed to better understand which ones were the ones that could get us the best bang for our buck, both in terms of energy reductions, but also greenhouse gas reductions. So um, that led us to benchmarking. And um, benchmarking, we decided was gonna be a really helpful tool for us to compare our, our buildings to one another, but also to the national medians. So this is something that we thought would make a lot of sense for our city buildings, but at the same time, there was an emerging trend in the United States, which many folks in this room have contributed towards around um, building benchmarking and disclosure, and starting to figure out how we can address um, building energy use issues in the commercial market space through required benchmarking um, legislation. So our city council expressed a lot of interest in this and we decided it was something that we wanted to pursue. I think, you know, along the way again, as we're looking every year doing our citywide um, greenhouse gas emissions reporting and our citywide energy use reporting, we started to see um, a troubling trend, which was that in the last couple of years we saw citywide building energy use go up and we thought, gosh, why is that happening? Why during a recession would building energy use go up? We thought, oh, if there's a reduction in commerce, then maybe um, energy use would go down. But we saw a kind of troubling spike back up between 2008 into 2012. And what we t were able to kind of tie that back to um, were two things. One, that during the recession, um, our working theory is that a lot of businesses had really constrained capital budgets, so there was deferred maintenance happening at kind of quite a large scale across the city. So, you know, you say, ah, oh, gosh, our boiler was scheduled to be replaced this year, but maybe we'll wait two more years until we can see a little bit more um, money coming in to spend on that. The city, you know, within one country and around the world, what we're certainly hearing from the real estate community is that consistency is essential. You know, you don't want to have a real estate company doing something totally different in Chicago than what they're doing in New York and Philadelphia. We need to be working together to figure out what works and replicate it and figure out how we can bring consistencies to the marketplace as much as possible. Um, and I think that we're starting to get some understanding of what the potential impact of working at scale can be. In the United States, more than three billion square feet of commercial and residential space are currently covered by these programs. So that's information we didn't have even just a couple of years ago that now we as a community have to work with and determine next policy steps and programs around. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap here and try to end 29 seconds early. Sorry, Roger, I really intended to go more quickly than that. Um, you know, I, I think our takeaway is what it was five years ago. Education is key. We really, even within our city government, the conversation around energy is very elementary still. It's still talking to the budget director, talking to the finance director, figuring out how we can reform our capital budgeting process. So it's not just about first cost, it's finally about life cycle cost. We need to do that within our city governments and we still need to really be doing that at the citywide level. I think we're just in the early days of that conversation in many of our cities and clearly we have a very long way to go in a very short period of time. So we're trying to figure out how to have um, a very trusting dialogue, but an increasingly intense one between the city and our commercial building owners. So with that, I will end and turn it back to Roger. Thanks. Thank you so much, Catherine. And <clears throat> I wanna just uh, reinforce that, like Monica, she emphasized that the very existence of these kinds of networks is how powerful ideas, in the case, the one that she really focused on, 
were these benchmarking policies, which have had a huge, huge benefit in the United States. And uh, so I'm glad she both raised that, but also emphasized, as Monica did, the way that and when Monica talked about how the Better Building Partnership was something that was really informed by what they were doing in London. This is how ideas get communicated, and it's at events like this and then in these networks that C40 is setting up so you can continue to do it um, between these uh, important meetings. <clears throat> Our last speaker is uh, uh, Miwa Gino. And uh, she is um, the Director of International Environment Cooperation, Urban and Global Environment Division at the Bureau of the Environment, Tokyo Metropolitan Government. And she is, um, with that extraordinarily long title, she is laser focused on uh, some of the buildings issues that we've been talking about today, including the, the famous now Tokyo uh, Cap and Trade Program. So we're, we're eager to hear um, Miwa, Miwa Gino-san will give a overview. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Roger. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, my name is Miwa Jinno, Director of International Cooperation in the Bureau of Environment to the Metropolitan Government. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to fellow members of the C40 Climate uh, Leadership Group. It's a great honor to be a part of the C40 and having fellow cities to work with toward a low carbon future is very connect, uh, encouraging for us. We also appreciate the lively information exchanges in the C40 community as we continue our daily efforts with the various environmental challenges facing us. Thank you very much. Today, I'm happy to have an opportunity to talk on Tokyo's building energy efficiency policy, introducing our overall policy framework briefly explaining our major programs and sharing some key points we have learned to date. So, uh, Tokyo has been focusing on building energy efficiency since we la launched a climate change policy around the year 2000. This is because carbon emissions from buildings make up a dominant share of total emissions in Tokyo as you can see on this chart. But at the same time, we also see these emissions from buildings as an opportunity containing an enormous amount of potential for carbon reductions, as was highlighted in IPCC reports. Tokyo sets its overall reduction target as 25% below 2000 levels by 2020. And in order to achieve this target, we have introduced various policies and programs. Firstly, uh, let me tell you about the framework of Tokyo's policy for building energy efficiency. I'd like to point out that our policy is targeting both new and existing buildings. These policies work in tandem toward better solutions. It's far easier to equip buildings with better insulation and facilities during construction than retrofitting. At a later date, therefore, for new buildings, the TMG Green Building Program requires a certain energy standard and also promotes higher environmental performance through its rating and disclosure scheme. However, even new buildings with advanced energy efficient designs cannot work efficiently if tuning and follow-up refinement are not properly done or operation of the facility is not correctly managed. So we also have programs for existing buildings, such as the cap and trade scheme, which promote retrofits and improve operational control. Secondly, I'd like to mention a policy development. Initially, we only covered very large buildings, but we have been expanding the target over the years and currently cover smaller buildings too. Thirdly, in order to promote further energy efficiency and emission reductions, we think improving a singular building is not enough. Now we are promoting district-wide plans for efficiency energy use 
and the introduction of district heating and cooling systems along with renewable energy. Today's um, Tokyo's pro programs initially started from around the year 2000, but we have re reviewed and revised the policy and programs every two to three years. For example, the CO2 emission reporting program for existing buildings has developed into the cap and trade program and reporting program for smaller facilities. The green building programs for new buildings was initially a simple rating and reporting program, but we had developed into sister programs such as labeling and certification system. I've given you a brief overview so far of some of the policies and programs we have in place. But today, I'd really like to focus on our efforts toward existing buildings. Now, let me briefly introduce our major programs. For large-sized existing buildings, we have the Tokyo Cap and Trade Program. It currently covers 1,400 large-sized facilities covering most prominent office and commercial buildings in Tokyo. Building owners of the covered facilities are required to reduce their total emission by 6% for the first five years from their own base year emissions. For the second five years, they have to reduce 15%. Total emissions are included even those from tenant-occupied area. Tenants also have an obligation to work together with owners. Now it's in the fourth year, and we, uh, we are really pleased to have seen some remarkable results. According to the third year reports from covered facilities, total emission reduction is 23%, which has exceeded the original cap of 6%. Um, in more recent developments, we have also been focusing on smaller existing buildings, which are not covered by the cap and trade program. We launched carbon reduction reporting, which is mandatory reporting program, requiring building owners to submit and disclose their carbon emissions and their plan for energy efficiency measures. Now, we have started to provide owners with benchmarking information based on the data collected, and we encourage the owners to use this data to improve building efficiency. We are looking forward to enhancing this benchmarking system more in the near future. Currently, over 21,000 reports are submitted by the program mandate, and in an additional 11,000 reports are gathered both through other program requirements and voluntary submissions. We have introduced and implemented various programs, but are still always on the lookout for better solutions. However, through our experience, there are some key findings that I'd like to share. Firstly, stakeholder engagement. The open and transparent forums to which all stakeholders are invited, have always been the key to success, even though they haven't always gone smoothly at first. Especially regarding energy efficiency, introducing policies alone is not, it's not the goal. Implementation with active commitments of building owners, tenants, facility managers, and engineers is essential for success. In this sense, Encouraging these st uh, stakeholders to get involved from the initial stage is what we have to do, even if it takes time and the road is not smooth. Secondly, disclosing the performance of buildings in, in an easy to understand and compare format is also very important. When we provide comparative data with other buildings of a similar type, building owners realize they have efficiency levels and potentials to do more. Thirdly, disclosure of information alone is not enough. We also have to utilize such information. On this point, local governments have many opportunities. We can link with urban planning, taxation, and various other policies and programs to encourage, support, and incentivize stakeholders. 
finally, let me conclude by telling you how much we appreciate the international linkages with other cities. We have been learning from various advanced policies and programs of cities around the world. Both up-to-date information on effective uses of technology and global market trends are becoming increasingly more important. The internet and documents are not enough. We believe that it will be more important than ever to conduct first-hand information exchange among real practitioners in cities. In this sense, it's a great honor and pleasure for us to host the PSP workshop next June in Tokyo. We are very much looking forward to sharing and the fruitful results with our fellow cities. Fortunately, Tokyo was chosen as the host city of the, the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2020, and we really hope to use this event to contribute further to environmental issues internationally. We are looking forward to future collaboration and information exchange among member cities while also being an active contributing member to the network ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miwajino. That was uh, wonderful, very, very clear, very compelling. And I don't know that there's almost any other city I'm aware of that does the opposite of setting crazy, super, super ambitious goals and then just really hoping they can do it. But in, in your case, setting the goal of 6% and then being able to announce that you did four times better than your goal, I think that's, that's very, very impressive. And it, it really demonstrates to people that <clears throat> more can be accomplished than is, um, is, is initially uh, imagined. So that is wonderful, wonderful news. Um, I'm going to take, before I bring the uh, panelists up, I'm going to take the prerogative of the moderator and just draw your attention to uh, some materials that are on the chairs next to you that are, that is a, <clears throat> excuse me, a distilled uh, portrait of Tokyo's uh, building performance activities. And I want to let you know that the World Green Building Council, whose board I'm on, has a partnership with C40 where we are working on similar types of documents for every C40 city. And we are plugging these into the various and relevant networks where we are um, uh, acting as a support for C40. So if you have interest in working with us on a similar simple distilled picture of your city, um, please talk to me or Shannon, and we'll be happy to get back with you and give you some uh, expertise and plug you into the World Green Building Council, Green Building Council in your community. Um, with that, I want to bring up the panelists so that we can uh, get a chance to grill them a little bit more in the very small amount of time we have and possibly get some um, uh, audience questions. Shannon, are we okay with that? All right, okay. Okay, we have seven minutes and 43 seconds. <laughs> no pressure. We'll see who, I'll try to make the questions sufficiently challenging that we can weed out those that don't want to answer them. Um, I, I thought that um, everybody uh, emphasized both uh, their, <clears throat> everybody emphasized both the remarkable um, things that could be accomplished uh, I think Claudio in particular uh, highlighted the tremendous challenges with conflicting government regulations, conflicting departments of, of your city. Now it cannot be that Claudio is the only person that is experiencing these, um, these conflicts. And I, I wondered if um, a few of you could just talk a little bit about um, some challenges you had, obstacles to scaling your program kind of citywide or region-wide, and then if you had some ideas of what you've learned in, in addressing those challenges. I will uh, take um, hands on this if there's someone who wants to talk about it. We'll start with, uh, yes, start with Matthew. Uh, well, um, London's uh, also quite an old city, uh, originally Roman, um, although there's very little Roman stuff visible, it's in the ground. But uh, we have a lot of older, older buildings, and um, we reckon 80% of our current building stock will still be here in 50 years' time. 
and we have rows and rows and rows of uh, what we like, uh, architecturally, Victorian terraces especially, and many of them are in what we call conservation areas, and there are rules on what you can, quite strict planning rules on what you can realistically do to them. And unfortunately, solid wall, beyond doing the windows or the roof, you are looking at solid wall insulation, and uh, that means putting it on the outside, which I'm afraid to say is not very attractive and often falls foul of planning, or putting it on the inside, which means making people's rooms smaller, and that doesn't go down very well either. So you can see that there is a potential, there is a problem there, and that particular one is one I don't think we're going to overcome at scale until a cost-effective, very thin, phase-change type material um, comes into being. So. Uh, we should all put pressure on the uh, R&D people to come along with that, with that technology. Um, I suppose the other thing, difficult as we've had, is with national government has been changing some of the eco rules um, in the United Kingdom. Now, um, in some ways it's quite good because we have a defined amount of uh, money for a longer period, but it does mean that my officials are constantly trying to re change slightly the program in order to maintain delivery and having national government changing um, often because of, I'm afraid to say, short-term political pressures, not so from the governing party, but the, being past political here, from the opposition party, um, can make it quite difficult. Uh, and I, I'm sure my colleagues uh, have that as well. I saw Monica uh, nodding a little bit in agreement when you were talking about the challenges with the, um, the national government policies. No? Okay. Just quickly, look, and, and it's been the topic of this, a, a lot of this conference is what happens when you have that lack of alignment across, you know, the, the different levels of government. And so what's happened to us is that government, and I, I have to say, probably because of being influenced by, you know, um, you know, other stakeholders and other groups with vested interest, have um, done things like change some of the uh, neighbours' ruling. And that meant that some of the things that you could count as part of your neighbour's rating no longer could be counted, and that took away the incentive for doing certain things. So uh, the other one is that in Australia you still can't get a um, an energy licence, a, a small an energy licence for a dis, um, small uh, 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 you know, district type um, facilities. So. When you don't have that clear alignment, government can get in there, change regulation because they're listening to one group, and then it has an impact on everything else. We all know this, uh, but I think we all uh, experience it and suffer from it. Yeah, I'll say just on the alignment front, I think the problem we have internally within our city government is the same one that we see externally with the commercial sector, which is that the people who are on the budget and finance side are usually not the same or have any relationship to the people who are on the building side. So the folks who know those buildings, who know what the needs are, who know what the challenges are, often aren't at the table either when they're paying utility bills or making decisions about upgrades. So um, I, there's a real disconnect there. And with our municipal program, we've been really kind of making the case as we go along. We didn't have a retrofit program in place. There was a lot of skepticism as to whether or not we'd be able to realize the projected savings that we were promising when we did the audits and put plans forward. So we've been really having to build support project by project, and the good thing is that our projects are successful as we had um, thought they would be. So, you know, every project is now leading to another project, but we still don't have a build out within our city government for how can we really do this at scale. We've done um, our first performance contracting project, which was really successful, and, you know, our treasurer now has information that gives them confidence around the next one, but it's been very hard for us to figure out how to kind of be going on all cylinders at once, even though the need is there, um, we still don't have that alignment. Can you pass it down to Claudio? Because I want to um, ask him now, <clears throat> I remember from uh, high school that uh, while Rome has been a powerful and very significant country almost unto itself for a long time, Italy was only uh, united in 1840 something. And um, so surely the issue of national government and so the Italian government overall and Rome is also a something you need to navigate. Give us some of your uh, thoughts on that. Yes, this is uh, true. I think that, uh, first of all, we can start to work uh, at local level. And uh, I don't want you to think that we are doing anything and nothing in Rome. For example, I think that uh, a good work we implemented, that we continue to implement, is uh, with the schools. Because uh, we started uh, to schools uh, uh, a long time ago, but we take in your mind that we have, we are working on 30 schools uh, this year in uh, 
2014, I will complete the work of energy uh, saving uh, in this school. And uh, schools are an excellent laboratory because uh, we implemented, for example, geothermal energy in school and we coupled the green roof with the PV plants uh, to produce energy. So it is an important uh, laboratory because uh, the families can see that we are doing things in the city and that uh, the children can say, this is the goals, these are the goals we are working with. Nevertheless, uh, uh, the action is to exchange ideas, to say what really we need, and uh, to have a table to sit around and to say what are the possible solutions to implement and how to implement, and to, fi and to find the equilibrium point, uh, putting on the table the problem or the question we have to solve. That's, that's extremely uh, positive. The, 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 the idea that you could have um, a school heated and cooled in Rome with, what were you saying? It was with um, the um, uh, thermal. Yeah. That is staggering. So obviously you're ambitious. Um, I will just, uh, f I will just uh, complete this line of questioning. Maybe, Miwa, just if, if there's anything you want to say about uh, how you work with the uh, national government of Japan or what if there are issues related to uh, national policies that also help you accomplish your goals or get in the way of, of accomplishing your goals? Uh, uh, we could accomplish this uh, goal by ourselves. Oh, okay. because, <laughs> yeah, because the national government doesn't do anything. So, yeah, uh, yeah, but... Maybe anyway. on that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, government, um, no, um, our governor, was a very decisive person, so his leadership uh, lead us to this yeah, successful uh, experience. Very good. Thank you so much. We have room for one question. That gentleman there on the far right. Thanks. I'll pretend not to know. Yes. Oh, well, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Really great presentation. Um, my name is Sadhu from the city of Vancouver, and. We we've, uh, we've got 2020 targets, and we're really looking at our next level of targets, the 2050 targets, and I'm curious, you know, the buildings that we're building now, based on the building codes that we have, and the targets that we have now, are probably gonna be around by 2050, and so, kind of curious to see how you guys are thinking about the, the immediate term and the building codes, and how that's setting the stage for our 2050 targets, and, and what that looks like for thinking kind of long term. We've set a target of all new large buildings to be carbon neutral in operations by 2020, and just kind of trying to think about making sure we don't make investments now that are not going to help us in the long run to achieve those targets. And so just curious, what's your roadmap look like for that? How are you juggling short term versus long term in each of those cities? Thank you, Roger. Okay, we're going to have uh, brutally short answers to this, followed by lively dialogue by you and others coming up and talking to these folks, because we're kind of out of time. But um, so with with that um, perhaps unfair thing, Matthew, maybe, do you have any thoughts that you can um, we, the, tease your thoughts? The Mayor of London has, um, through his building codes, <clears throat> the big strategic uh, developments, um, it's called Part L in our building codes, um, some, we're delivering something like 10% above what is demanded through the current law, and we are tightening that year on year. The government has set a target, and this is not gospel, so don't quote me. Something like, quite soon, 2016, zero carbon, new homes. That isn't for private development. But we're also using the, um, uh, the development uh, planning rules in, in London to have more and more uh, energy generated locally with heat networks. And that's okay, one thing that's that we can see um, having a more secure, cheaper, and, and lower carbon energy supply in the capital. Monica, you're going to have the last word on this. Okay, so in Australia we have three levels of government and we have difficulties with both of the, those levels. We as a local government can't put in any planning laws unless there is a planning policy done by the state government that allows us to do it. Nevertheless, we've done quite a lot of work looking at what the new kind of planning rules should be so that people are compelled to build more efficient buildings going forward. We did the work as for residential, for multi-unit residential. It's still there. It was rejected, but we will continue to advocate for that. And like um, London, as well as that, you know, we're looking... First, we want to, you know, squeeze every ounce of efficiency out of what's there. And that's why we've got that energy efficiency master plan work that will soon be coming to C40 for review. Uh, but then, then we're also looking at supply, the same as London, looking at decentralised um, supply as well. 
Okay, well, I think, I think they did a spectacular job, very, very good presenters. Now, if you thought they did a spectacular job, you need to also be part of these networks where you can continue your, your engagement. If you thought they did not do a good job and you could have done a better job, get on those networks and help people. So thank you very much. I'm glad you could all make it.